So starting with the RFID lab vision, um, the idea for the RFID lab here at Auburn is, is connecting companies with the university to work on business problems that can be solved with RFID and emerging technologies. Now that sounds a little bit um, bland when you just read it out on, on paper, but what it truly means is we're a technology lab, but we don't necessarily focus on developing new technology. We're not trying to make new RFID tags. We're not trying to make new and better RFID readers. What we are doing is trying to look at new applications, uh, new prototypes, uh, new technologies as they're developed, and find ways when they will fit into a, a retail store or the retail supply chain or the supply chain in general. Um, we study what's the best new technology fit and what's the bottom line business value for using those new technologies. So it's not just about having a, of a cool new product or, or a neat new technology. It's figuring out how to make that technology pay for itself and what's the actual value of using it. Um, so in that aspect, we're very unique. Um, there are a few academic RFID labs uh, around the U.S. and around the globe, but um, all of them that we know of are, are specifically focused on new product development. Um, this is a, a new idea to look at it from the, the, the side of the business problem. Um, we have a, a few different um, constituents that help make up the, the, the team to help realize that vision. And, and it's the solution for the companies that are making uh, RFID tags and making readers, making software, and making new products. Um, it's the end users. And the end users typically in this case are the retailers and the retail product manufacturers. Uh, those are the stores, those are the chains, and then those are the brands, whether it's t-shirts or tennis shoes or electronics or whatever it may be. Those are the people who are purchasing and using the RFID technology. And then the faculty and the students. And the faculty and students work together here at the lab to, to do the research, uh, to publish new um, 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 information about how to use RFID and, and even new things that we might not even know about how RFID works and, and those students participate in the research and hopefully move on to uh, internships and permanent positions out in the industry. So the mission is uh, to study the business value of RFID technology as we said. Um, we focus heavily on physical and disruptive technologies, including a strong change management component. So a disruptive technology is something that changes the way that a, a business normally operates. So a prime example in retail is a barcode. If you think about retail stores uh, in up until the, the late 70s, um, there were no barcode scanners in use. Um, when it came time to check out, you would have a cashier that would type in the information. When it came time to do inventory, you would have someone walk the shelves with a clipboard. Uh, when barcodes came around and became widely implemented, it, it heavily disrupted how retail stores operate. Uh, disruption is not necessarily a negative term. It just means that things were done very differently after that. Uh, you started seeing uh, barcode scanners at the checkout, which meant the checkout process was a lot faster, which meant that the way that the cashier handled the items at the register was very different. Uh, the way that the software systems for the stores are registered and use the item data was different as well. And the way that they took inventory was different with the barcode scanners that you see in the store today. So RFID is also a disruptive technology. It's going to change the way that retail stores operate. Uh, if you look at the image on the right, you see um, one of the students holding an RFID handheld. Uh, what she's doing is scanning all of the items on that shelf. It takes about one to two seconds. Uh, for her pulling the trigger on that RFID scanner to, to scan and register all of those items without having to have a visible line of sight. It's, it's RFID. It happens uh, almost automatically. So that's a very different model of, of taking inventory than going through and checking things with a checklist or even scanning them with a barcode scanner. Uh, and when you have a disruptive technology, you have to understand change management. You have to understand how people are going to use these things, and they have to know how to use it properly so that they can do their new jobs more effectively. We really look uh, closely in that one to five year adoption window. We do look at some futuristic technologies, but we like to look at futuristic stuff that we're going to see sometime soon. Um, it's not all looking at uh, the Jetsons. It's more of things that we are expecting to see in, in retail stores 
um, uh, lots of times before the, the students that are working on them even get out of college. And implementation support for folks who are going through adoption now. Uh, we support a lot of different implementations. So a little background, uh, Vicki kind of um, um, hinted at this, but the lab was established in 2005 at the University of Arkansas. Um, we were in the business college there at the time. Um, Walmart is right there next to University of Arkansas. And in 2005 and 2006, Walmart really kind of led and launched the modern era of RFID and retail uh, with some case level and pallet level RFID requirements. Uh, the center started there initially as an education resource for helping uh, uh, teach people what RFID was, and we've grown from there. We focus primarily on retail and the retail supply chain, and that tripartite purpose we have there is, is research, engagement, and education. You'll see these three uh, terms used for, for many different research centers throughout uh, universities. But, and it sounds simple, but it, it works. It's doing the research and, and driving the industry forward. It's engaging with external partners, so it's not just you know ivory tower work. We're actually working with the retailers and the suppliers in the field. And it's education. It's educating the students here uh, so that they'll be more effective in that space when they graduate. So our current research request trends, this is something that we, we track um, pretty regularly. Right now, uh, very heavy in retail, obviously. That's probably our prime driver right now. Uh, a little bit on manufacturing, and manufacturing touches on retail as well, but uh, it's understanding how RFID works in factories, how we can use it to, to track the uh, parts as they're being assembled and, and to the final product that will go to retail store. And then also we've got a lot going on in uh, aerospace. Um, aerospace uh, supply chain mirrors pretty closely the retail supply chain in, in a lot of ways. It's just on a much larger scale and, and with a different dollar amount sometimes. But uh, today we're going to focus primarily on, on retail and retail manufacturing. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the University or Auburn directly might uh, recognize some of these names. Uh, for those of you who are not, I'm not going to go through all these directly. Uh, but with the engineering department, we engage with a, a variety of faculty on, on different projects. So these are some grant support um, proposals that we've helped with, and these are some active projects that we're helping with now. Um, one of which you can see over there on the right is the, the Beam uh, robot. So that robot is actually a virtual presence robot used for teleconferencing. Uh, one of the first things we were able to do was attach an RFID handheld to it. It might not look like much. But that is essentially a, a mobile unit that can go out into a retail store and, and do a cycle count and do an inventory with an RFID handheld um, while a, a, a remote user can sit in an office somewhere and, and direct its movements. Uh, it's a new thing that we've kind of been playing around with at the lab. Human sciences, again, a whole other list of faculty there. Um, they're looking at uh, this from the perspective of how consumers shop, how they make decisions when they're in the store. So that device you see there is actually a, a, an EEG. It's a brainwave scanner. So essentially, um, while we can track while a customer goes to the store, uh, what sh she thinks whenever she's looking at items on the shelf, how she interacts with them, um, what she feels whenever she's um, using new types of technology in the retail store. This is a way to gauge how effective uh, these new technologies are. And then some of these other projects are, are simply focused on uh, using that lab space for um, a consumer product behavior. Um, as we'll see in a moment, the lab is very large. It's 13,000 square feet. We have some model retail stores in there that uh, can be used for full-on shopping, monitoring research. And then in a business college. And, and here it's a little more esoteric. Um, you'll see a lot of faculty listed here, and, and cycle count frequency doesn't sound too exciting for those folks who might not work directly in retail, but this is answering those core premise questions of how do we use this. So if we're going to go out there and use RFID to take inventory in our stores, how often do we need to do that? Do we do it every day? Do we do it every week? Do we do it every other day? And we're doing a lot of research here to figure out how that works most effectively. Uh, and there's a few other applications from big data to market adoption and even uh, uh, geospatial re research uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Sankar and uh, Dr. Kahai, so uh, it's a good mix in the business college too. 
one of the things we're working on real closely, and this is a big trend change in, in um, retail right now, as you see this as, a, as a, an exit scanner. Now, these are not RFID portals that you see here before you. Um, you're all familiar with them if you've shopped in a retail store anywhere in probably the past 20 years. Uh, these are those exit gates. So uh, you purchase products, I'm sure, that have a little tag on there. They either scan it and wave it over a magnetic uh, a device at the, at the checkout station, or, or if it's a hard tag, they take it off the clothes sometimes. If they forget to remove or deactivate those tags, when you go to the exit, you hear that beep at the portal. Um, they, sometimes some of the systems will talk and say, you have activated the inventory control system. <clears throat> Generally, what happens is the customer stops. Someone from the store takes a look through the items. In most cases, it's just that they forgot to deactivate the, uh, the little uh, EAS tag on there. But those systems that we currently have in stores, the non-RFID EAS systems, they don't have any intelligence on them. They don't know how many things are leaving and what things are leaving. They don't know anything about it. Even for the folks who are shoplifting, those systems can't tell what was shoplifted after the, the alarm goes off. Um, what we're looking at now in retail is a change towards RFID. If we use RFID tagged items in the store, we know exactly what each item was that left that store. It's no longer just a matter of setting off some type of an alarm in the exit. It's a matter of we set off an alarm, but we also have a list of all of the individual items that left because they have RFID tags on them and we can recognize them. So even if you don't catch someone who uh, was shoplifting, um, you still know what they took, which is important because you have a hole on the shelf that you need to, to fix. And then if it's a recurring shoplifting problem, it helps the stores identify trends. So this is a big, big change in the way that stores view uh, their inventory and they view theft and loss in those stores. And we're doing some research now uh, to uh, uh, convince uh, uh, or at least put some data behind how those traditional EAS systems work versus RFID systems. Um, we know from preliminary data that they work extremely well, um, but we're trying to codify that and put it in a paper and report so that retailers will feel confident moving to those systems in the future. Manufacturing aerospace product authentication. So this is happening in aerospace, but I put this in here because it's very important to retail as well. Um, authentication is a big deal. Um, we don't see this in the news that often, but more and more times um, products that we purchase and buy and use uh, are counterfeit. Um, there's money to be made in that, especially for higher value items. Um, you'll see you know, knockoff brand purses and designer items online. Um, it's even gotten to the point to where um, some pharmaceuticals and, and even just normal food items in stores can be counterfeit or knockoff. If we have RFID tags on these items, we can use it to authenticate those parts from the source. So one of the areas that's really pushing that for innovation is, is manufacturing in aerospace. Um, as those standards become more prevalent in those areas, we expect that to move back onto uh, manufacturing in, in normal um, retail goods. Uh, clothing, food, things like that. So it's understanding how we can authenticate those parts and understanding how we can make sure that the data is accurate and correct whenever we receive them to the stores. Past research. So I'm just going to go through this slide real quickly. Um, we've done research for the past 10 years on a variety of different topics. If you go to our website, there's a whole section for white papers, and we have uh, about uh, 20 different white papers there. Uh, we've done inventory accuracy and store execution studies with Walmart, Dillard's, American Apparel, and a slew of other retailers. Um, we've done some environmental sensor tags for cold chain, which I'll talk about in a moment. We've done some of that with Deloitte and uh, C.H. Robinson and Tyson. Um, we've done some research on asset management, which is tool tracking and, and uh, in uh, facility assets for Northrop Grumman and a few others. Uh, and then we've also done some research on fingerprinting RFID tags, and that kind of goes back to that anti-counterfeiting thing we talked about before making sure that things aren't, uh, are what they say that they are. So here's a most basic example of our research that I can give. Um, what we know from a whole lot of different studies with a whole lot of different retailers is that there is an inventory accuracy problem in retail stores today. Best example I can give you of that. Uh, if you go online, and, and many retailers offer this now, um, you can go online and look up a particular product. Let's say you want a, a television or a computer printer. 
um, and you have a particular model, some retailers will allow you to check local stores and see if they have any of that particular model in inventory. So if you have a printer you want to buy, you check a store website, and the store website says that they have two of those items in the local store. Now you get in your car and drive down to that store. If they have the two items like they said, you purchase one, you go home, and everything's great. If they don't have those two items in the store, most consumers are quite upset because it's not just the fact that the store didn't have the item, it's the fact that the store told you as a customer that they did, you went down there, and then they don't have it. So this is a problem of what's called inventory accuracy in retail. Uh, inventory accuracy means that the store has the number of items in it that the store system thinks that it has. Now, inventory accuracy is a, is a constant battle because there's many, many things that cause uh, inaccuracy. Uh, theft causes inaccuracy. Damages cause inaccuracy. Spoilage causes inaccuracy. People in the stores cause inaccuracy because they'll pick things up in one place and put it down in the wrong place on the other side of the store. Um, there's a lot of things that can affect the overall number that the store thinks it has versus what that store thinks that it has. And based on a lot of studies from many different retailers internationally, the average is about 65%. So what that means is for any given product in a store, when you check how many are on the shelves versus how many the store thinks they have, only 65% of those items match up. That's a shockingly low number um, compared to how we think of uh, uh, store accuracy. Uh, you know when yourself, when sometimes you'll go to a store and you don't see something on the and you'll ask the store if they have it in the back room. They say, well, the system says we do, and they go back around and look around, well, we can't find it. That's an example of that inventory inaccuracy. Um, what we found is using uh, RFID, we're able to see a fairly drastic change in that store inventory accuracy. So typically that inventory accuracy rate moves from 65% to about 95%. That's a huge change for retailers. That means that they know more of what they have and more of where they have it, which is really important for knowing when you're out of stock on things and knowing when you need more things on the shelf. Uh, but it's also important to the example I told you earlier. Um, the way that we shop as consumers in retail stores is, is changing, and it's changing quickly. Um, we don't just go down to stores and look for things anymore. Um, most people will do research online to decide what kind of product they want. They might even do some cross-shopping online. Um, there's even options to go into a store and purchase things from a phone in the store while you're standing there sometimes, or even order more if they don't see them there. So we're moving toward what we call, what we call omni-channel, and it means there are many, many different channels that a cons customer can purchase things. It's not just what's in front of them on the shelf in the store. But in order for omnichannel to work, we have to have this much higher level of inventory accuracy. So you'll see retailers like Macy's and some of the others that are very heavily invested in RFID, and they will say and have said publicly many times, the only way that they're going to get to a true omnichannel store to make their customers happy no matter how they're purchasing things is to make certain that all of that inventory in that store is there and they know where it is. You can't do modern retailing with 65% inventory accuracy, which is why there's been this huge change and huge shift towards RFID in retail stores over, over the past uh, uh, four or five years. All right, don't let this slide intimidate you. Um, I'm not going to talk all the way through this. All I want to show is that there's also some benefits uh, upstream from the retail store. So what you're seeing here is a map or a model of a distribution center. You can see a picture of one over there on the side, and distribution centers are where retail products come in, and they're aggregated, and they're sent out to the stores. There's lots of different things that happen in that retail store, from receiving to stocking to pick pack and so on and so forth. Um, what we found is, is we integrate RFID into that process, and all those little numbers you see by those boxes are a different type of RFID we can use. We can make some pretty um, significant uh, improvements in how those distribution centers operate. For example, if you're packing a case in a distribution center, you don't want to have to count every single item by hand before you ship it out. Ideally, you'd be able to read the RFID tags inside there and, and, and automatically know what's in there without having to have someone um, do that visual count for each box that goes through the door. It makes the process much more efficient. Uh, it makes the process much more accurate. 
uh, and it makes uh, uh, employees uh, able to do more, fulfill more orders. Because what we're doing now is, again, a lot of the, the ship to home or ship to store orders are coming out of these same distribution centers. So you're trying to use more people to fulfill these omnichannel customer requests and use less people just to try to get the right amount to the stores in the first place for special orders and things like that. So RFID is a huge help in this area in terms of, of validating those items before they're shipped. And here's an example of that. So, you know, what we're looking at right now is RFID versus manual audits. Uh, what we're seeing is a, a product that's being shipped to a retailer, and you see that back-to-school increase there. So in this instance, this is a, um, uh, an apparel item. Um, if we, that black line on top there is the number of actual items that are being shipped. Uh, that dotted red line on the bottom is a 10% item level manual quantity audit. Uh, that's the typical standard right now for checking things that are going out the door in a distribution center. Um, you have people that are opening cases and looking at the items in there and checking to see that that order is accurate to that bottom curve, but you're actually shipping to that top black curve. Uh, what we can do with RFID is we can go to what's called a 100% quantity audit. We're using RFID scanners so we can read everything in that box without opening it. So we know for 100% of the items that we ship out the store, exactly what was supposed to be in that box. That's really important for retailers to make sure that they get the accurate inventory that they requested and for suppliers to make sure that they're shipping what there's, what's been ordered. Uh, here's something to shift uh, gears just a little bit and this is a similar concept but this is with a uh, cold chain and temperature tagging. So what we've also been able to do in the past is use these RFID tags that are on those items that are go going through the supply chain uh, in the last slide, it was uh, uh, apparel items going out the door, but uh, you can also look at uh, cold chain. So, and these are pallets of items um, that are going onto a truck. It's a reefer truck. Um, that's what they call the big refrigerated 18-wheeler trucks. And on the right, you can see how all those pallets are stacked there in that truck. And on the left, you can see that red line, which is the temperature that's inside of the truck. That's the container set point. And then the blue lines, we can see the temperatures average across all of those pallets in that truck. So what's going on is we have RFID tags on all those pallets, and those RFID tags are monitoring temperature over time. And you can see that, sure enough, those two pallets towards the back of the truck by the doors, number 10 and 22, they had much higher average temperatures. Now, if you think about grocery, um, this is really, really important in helping people understand what items are the most fresh whenever they come into a store. So we know what items go out first. Um, we know um, um, the history of that item, if you will, and we know what's safe and we know what's what not safe. And, and what's more important than that, too, is we, we can kind of help make sure that we're not wasting a lot of food items. There's an enormous amount of food that we're shipping through to stores to try to get the consumers today that's just going to waste because um, we left it in the wrong place, we didn't understand the history of it, or it went over temp cycles. Um, we're trying to get a handle on that. Um, it makes uh, prices cheaper for the consumer, it makes things more efficient, uh, and it's just better for everyone all around if we can only ship the stuff or ship most of the stuff we're trying to sell instead of having to ship 20 or 30 percent more because we know things that are going to spoil along the way. So RFID, especially the, the temperature tracking RFID, can help with that. Here's the same data looked at a little differently, and this is looking at one of those uh, pallets, and this is looking at temperature tags tracking over time. So you can see uh, over uh, the history of, of one particular pallet here how the temperature fluctuated. As we study that and we understand it, we're able to make better decisions about that retail grocery supply chain. Visual identification technology, and this is really getting into the emerging technology in retailers today. This is the new things. With RFID, we're able to do a really good job of taking inventory of all the items on the shelf. Visual technologies are cropping up all over the place, and those of you with smartphones or iPhones or Android phones have probably played with some augmented reality apps in the past where you can use your camera and it'll take a picture of the surrounding environment and it'll overlay it with information from the phone, from games or just finding more information or whatever it may be. Now, what may be surprising to you is these images that you're seeing here are not photographs. These images are actually 3D point clouds. So what we've learned to do is to take some 3D scanners, in this case it's a laser scanner, 
uh, and create a 3D model of the environment in the store and the items on the shelf in the store. Uh, from that 3D model, we can make all kinds of decisions about uh, shelf capacity. So if we understand what's on the shelf versus how much space is left on the shelf, we can do some um, verification to make sure that things are there that are supposed to be there. And we can also do some optimization to make sure that we're using the shelves correctly. Uh, think of it this way. When you go to a grocery store, it's pretty big most of the time. There's tons and tons and tons of product on that shelf. Uh, but you're filling up your basket to purchase things that go out through there. If you can make the shelves more optimized, you have to do less walking around to find things to purchase the same amount of items to go out the store. Also, identification, we're validating and verifying that items are not changing in packaging. They still fit on the shelf. Uh, out of stock, we're looking to see for those holes in the shelf for out of stock. Uh, item identification and item location, these are also important. So if you look at the top left picture up there, you can kind of tell what those products are, and I can actually uh, read the all brand on one of the labels up there. If we can use this visual technology to identify those items and to nail down the specific location of the items, we've identified what it is and where it is. Now then, what we can't see is the items that are behind it. So visual is really good at telling us what things are and where they are. It's not as great at counting things. We don't know how many shirts are on those rounders just from a visual view. But with RFID, we do. So when we pair these technologies together, using RFID for counting and using the visual for identifying location and space, um, we get some extremely powerful tools for retail stores. This is a change. This is a huge change in the way that retail is going to happen in the future. You're not going to just walk into stores and see huge racks and rows of items as we're seeing uh, now in grocery stores and retail stores. Uh, within the next five or ten years, uh, stores are going to be drastically different, and they're going to be geared towards helping you as a customer find the things that you want to see and, and present those items to you for purchase with less just filling the store with inventory so that customers have plenty to browse off of. Um, but this visual item technology is, is the next wave even after RFID, and all these technologies are going to integrate together as we go forward. Uh, and the Auburn RFID lab has taken, a, it's taken a strong lead in that space as well. Uh, engagement. So a lot of folks ask us, you know, kind of how does this work? Um, we're a little different. We're a research institute here at Auburn. Um, so we work with many different companies via an industry advisory board. Um, we have those partners I talked about on the earlier slide, which are the solution providers and the retailers and the retail product manufacturers. And, they all sit on an advisory board we have here at the lab, and that advisory board meets three times a year. Um, we discuss research. We discuss industry needs. We try to figure out where things are going, and, and more importantly, they point out new types of technology that we can bring in and research. Um, we provide some services to that industry. Um, we do some testing and things like that, but uh, the biggest service we provide is education. We have a, a lab. Um, that lab is a touring facility. It's about 13,000 square feet. Now, if any of you are interested, I encourage you to give me a call and come on down. We do tours uh, every day. Um, more than that, actually, last week alone, I think we had uh, over 10 tours, and we had over 100 people um, just on uh, between Wednesday and Friday. So we have a lot of people coming through there, um, everyone from Girl Scout troops to, to industry professionals that they want to see and understand how RFID works in the model retail space and, and also think of other applications that might work for other industries. Uh, we're very active in the standards community and we're a founding member of the Global RF Lab Alliance. Which I'll show you directly. Uh, the current lineup, this is a current list of, uh, of advisory board members that are supported in that lab. Um, some of those names you may recognize, some of those you may not. Uh, some are uh, industry um, service providers and, and, and some are, are retailers and retail product manufacturers. One of the things that we do for the industry is the ARC program. So this is RFID testing and grading. Um, what you'll see here is a real easy high level overview. Um, what we do, we see in that top picture there, is we go into retail stores and we understand how those products are stored out there on the shelf and we do some testing to create a, a grade uh, for that environment or, or specification for performance. We go back to the lab and we do some testing on products in the lab. 
Um, we can test lots and lots of different products before they have to actually go to the retail store to verify that those products meet that grade with their RFID tags. Um, this makes us certain that when they get to the store, they're going to read when we do those inventory scans. Uh, and then finally, we go back and we validate that process. So that step, that, that, that process of creating a grade, testing against the grade, and verifying that out there in the store is crucial to making sure that any RFID implementation is successful. Um, this program has been very successful. We've been doing it for a few years. Uh, in the last uh, year especially, we've been partnering with uh, GS1. Uh, GS1 is the industry uh, standards organization for retail data standards. Um, they have been developing a program for uh, uh, guidelines for grading called the TIP program, and uh, they have released that in the last few months. So we're, we're a strong supporter of that. We're a strong contributor, and, and we really believe in that going forward as a way for the industry to find standard ways to uh, grade uh, RFID products in the store and use them to make sure that we can move to the, to the volumes that we're going to see for all retail. Um, we do a lot a lot of supplier compliances, so the, uh, supplier compliance. So what we're seeing here is a, is a huge aggregate over some audits that we've seen. So this is 32,000, almost 33,000 items we saw in retail stores. So we do a lot of going through uh, for retailers and, and helping them understand what kinds of issues that they're seeing. Now this is for pilot programs. So this is some troubleshooting to help set things up in the first place. So when you see that total correct items number on the top, don't let that scare you. If it's not 100%, it's not supposed to be. Um, what we do when we move into new programs is it takes a little bit of time for everyone to figure out how to get their RFID tags on there and for us to figure out why there's not tags on them sometimes. Everyone to make sure that they're putting the correct data on the tags, uh, identify double tagging and other issues, and then also identify RFID problems where people are using the wrong tags on the wrong items sometimes or they're damaged. Um, when we're able to study the problem on a broad scale at this level of detail, then we're able to troubleshoot out each of these problems. Um, really, this is uh, very healthy. Uh, this is surprisingly good for such a large-scale implementation in, in a new space like retail. Um, and we're seeing uh, these numbers get better and better all the time. Um, but this is good. A lot of these problems, um, the interesting thing about RFID, a lot of these problems existed before RFID. These were barcode problems. Uh, no tag is not an RFID problem. Uh, items come into retail stores all the time with no barcode or no tag on them. Um, we weren't able to identify that before, but now with RFID, we can see those things that don't have tags on them and compare them to the ones that do. Uh, incorrect tag information. Again, that's not an RFID problem. That's just a barcode and, and tagging problem in general. So um, these are things that we are identifying that have always been issues in retail stores, but we're trying to make them go away completely here with RFID. Uh, quality manufacturing compliance. Um, this part is not as exciting unless you're an inlay manufacturer, but we do a lot of testing now for consistency and reliability. Um, we're working through a program currently for uh, building this out a little better, but we're, we're monitoring those RFID tags that are going out in the store and we're making sure that um, they're getting good, solid product, good, solid tags that are going on to these products. When you start shipping tens of millions or, or hundreds of millions of items into a retail store, it's really, really important that the RFID tags that you're buying and putting on all those items are some good, quality, consistent tags, uh, because if they're not, you're going to start seeing uh, a lot of problems out there in the field, no matter how good the tags are individually, they all have to to meet those same standards of performance. The Global RFID Lab Alliance, I apologize, I know the logos could uh, be a little better, but um, you know, not all academics check with each other before they, they make new logos. Uh, these are a lot of labs that we work with globally, uh, some here in the U.S., some in Europe, some in Asia. Um, these are various different um, um, university labs that do RFID research. Most of them are from technology development, um, but um, some of them uh, also focus on cold chain and loss prevention like ARDA and some of the others. So we have a strong partner network uh, throughout uh, the labs. Education. So the lab is staffed with students, undergraduate, masters, and PhD. Um, we do webinars, seminars, and workshops, and we do edu executive education. One of the things I'm most proud of about this RFID lab is that all of the, the full-time employees that work there at the lab now 
were students at the lab whenever we started, myself included. I was a graduate student when we started the RFID lab, and as it grew over time, I eventually moved into the, the directorship role. Uh, Dr. Kumar was also a graduate student when he started at the lab. So we have a strong culture of letting the students come in and do that research themselves. This is experiential learning. Um, when people come to us and, and for faculty research or, or even just some help with education, the best way to teach a student something is to let them teach someone else how to do it. So we take those students, we put them out in front of the industry, we may help them build those relationships and build a network, and our goal is that every single student has a job well before they graduate. And they have a skill set that is unique that Auburn offers that other universities don't offer. And, and that's really what kind of keeps some of the industry com companies coming back here to uh, the RFID lab as well. The engagement, here's just a few lists of places that we've been referenced and uh, some um, news articles we've seen. Um, Wall Street Journal, Business Week, Forbes, Washington Post, London Financial Times, Information Week. Uh, generally, whenever something happens in the RFID space, if you Google RFID research now, uh, the Auburn RFID lab is going to come up several times in the top five entries. So we get a lot of uh, direct connections uh, when it comes to uh, uh, academic sources for, for RFID articles. Uh, the physical facilities, it's 13,000 square feet. It's in the former Bruno supermarket. It's on the corner of Glenn and University, for those of you familiar with the Auburn area. Um, there's two primary sections to the lab. There's a supply chain area and there's a store area. Um, what you're seeing here on the screen before you is the Anacort Chamber. It's about, excuse me, it's about a 15-foot uh, cube, and it has a, a space that we use for RFID testing inside there. That was part of the art program we mentioned earlier, and it's in one section of the lab. Here's a layout. Uh, uh, um, you can't tell much from the layout, but um, what you see in the top right is the supply chain space. We have a loading dock with various uh, loading dock doors. We have a warehouse area. We have a manufacturing space that uh, we use for uh, various different model manufacturing environments. We have the chamber area where we do the arc testing. And then on the left side, you see some model stores. So we have a back room space. Uh, we have a model grocery store that you see there on the left, and we have a model department store that you see there on the right, and some office space up front. So when you put all this together, we have the entire retail supply chain from receiving to the distribution center and then back to the back room of the store, out to the front, different store formats, and then out the door with the customers as they purchase them and take things home. Um, this is the, the space that we use for um, testing, and it's also for the, the demonstrators. And you can see a photo there. So this photo was actually taken last week. So this is some of the warehouse racking area. And you can see Sam there pulling a, a pallet of shoes through the, through the RFID portal. Um, we have uh, various different areas as well. So if we encourage you, if you ever get to come through on a tour, um, we'll show you all of it. We'll show you how RFID works in each section as well. Um, one thing to note, uh, we're having our grand opening in May 20th, 2015. Um, we're in the process of getting the invitations and announcements out the door now. So um, here is a photo of our grand opening way back in uh, 2005. Um, and um, you can see the RFID portal in the middle and the, and the, and the ribbon and, and Dean Hargrave there with the scissors cutting it, who was a faculty member at University of Arkansas at the time. Um, we will have something similar here in Auburn. So we've got quite a few people that are invited to come in. It's an open invite, so if any of you are interested, um, we'll have a, a link where you can RSVP to come to that. And then our next board meeting is the following day on the 21st. That board meeting is for that industry advisory board. Um, but if you're interested in seeing the new facility and, and seeing the newest building on Auburn campus, I guess, then uh, uh, come on down and uh, uh, we'll be happy to uh, show it to you. Okay. And uh, with that, um, Vicki, I think we're ready to uh, open up to some uh, questions. Thank you, Justin. That was a great presentation. We appreciate your, your time with us today. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if you have a question, uh, you can raise your hand, and I will unmute you, and you can ask it across the webinar, or you can submit it in a written version, and I will read that to the audience. We do want have one current question uh, for you. It is, 
Arkansas has just reported an outbreak of highly pathogenic avian influenza in a turkey flock. This outbreak will cause an embargo being placed on the affected area for international trade of meat and poultry byproducts. How could RFID technology be used to help certify the point of origin for meat products being placed in international commerce? Okay, good question. So um, this is one of those questions that we've um, kind of struggle with over time, it's, it's food safety really. Um, it's how can we make sure that the food that we're getting is safe and how can we track things, um, you know, farm to fork, I guess, if you will, but uh, going upstream further than we can now in terms of, of tracking, especially for, for meat and produce. So there's two different ways to look at that. One is ensuring safety on the individual products, which is kind of the temp tracking stuff, but um, put that aside because we already talked about that. Let's look at, you know, actual origin of the product itself. Um, with RFID tags, there's a variety of different systems, any, all the way from ear tags or, or tags for the animals, uh, band tags for chickens and turkeys and things like that, where you can put tags on them in the field and use it for, for tracking and managing them there. Um, the problem normally happens whenever, especially for, for animals, that they go to uh, the processing facility. Um, how do you make sure and keep up with the animals that went in versus the meat that comes out the other side and how do you, you match the two? Um, that's a really tough question and, and um, I don't know, you know, 100% of the answer, but I think it, you can at least start with making sure and understanding what animals are going in and then uh, if they have to re-tag the meat before it comes out, hopefully you, you can keep some of that origin information. Uh, generally, and, I, and again, I'm, I'm not as much of an expert on, on the food processing side, but my understanding is generally um, innovation in that space is, is driven by requirements. Um, so there's some type of legislation or some type of uh, mandate that, that the industry needs to meet for tracking. Um, but the issues with, you know, the cost, um, again, these RFID tags that we're looking at are anywhere from 7 to 12 cents a piece. So depending on what type of, of item you're putting the tags on, you have to factor that cost in. Um, it adds a lot of margin, a margin especially to grocery items. Uh, beyond the cost, there's some physics issues. Uh, RFID works on radio waves, and radio waves have issues with water. Water absorbs radio waves. So when you have RFID tags around things that contain a lot of water, like meat and produce, you have to make sure the tags on there so that you can read them. Um, if I have a whole pallet of, of socks, it's not a big problem to read all the tags on there with a, with a hand scanner or something like that. But if I have a whole pallet of meat, then um, it's really difficult to read all the things in the middle. I'm going to have to focus on the things on the outside. Uh, and then you also have issues with, you know, you're putting tags on food products. So, you know, there's a lot of, of push that goes towards um, ensuring that, that meat and things like that don't have any metal inside them and other types of things. So when you start talking about putting an RFID tag, which is usually printed aluminum, them on it, you have to make sure you put it on it so that it's safe so that people don't end up accidentally eating part of that with the packaging or something like that. So I think it's a big open question mark right now. There's a huge number of people that are interested in it, especially the solution providers who are trying to understand how to offer solutions to that space, um, but um, it's something that needs to be addressed. Um, I think the closest that will come is, is with some of the, the cattle tracking because we've seen some solutions for that in the past. But a lot of the farmers are very resistant to that as well. Um, there's a liability component that comes with it. So to the example to the Arkansas turkeys, if they track that back to one particular person, one particular farm, you know, what kind of liability does that, does that contain? Uh, well, I don't know. I think that's an open question mark. So. Um, and it sounds kind of, you know, it sounds a little tough to say that, but I mean, you know, nobody wants to be the person that gets singled out for the one that caused the problem, even though we need to identify those problems in the first place. So it's doing it in a manner that's transparent, that people can manage it responsibly, and, and, and doing it so that even the farmers can trust that it's not going to be used as, as a tool against them uh, if something goes wrong. Um, but if we can overcome those issues with cost, if we can overcome some of the physics issues, and if we can overcome and understand what the regulatory uh, requests are, then I think that we can really get towards something. Um, I think from our perspective, we've been thinking that as RFID gets more prevalent in retail for other products, 
that's going to encourage that confidence and familiarity that will help drive it back to uh, food for, for safety issues, as you asked. Great. Thank you, Justin. Um, and thank you, Bob, for submitting that question. Uh, are there any more questions before we wrap up today? All right, Dan, go ahead with your question. I, I would, again, like to thank you and particularly Justin for an incredibly interesting presentation. And um, I've always been a big believer that, that you know, your university life is more than just the books. And I really applaud you for getting students involved and, and helping them along a career path. I thought that was uh, probably... Uh, something that could be replicated in a lot of other uh, areas of the university. We hear too frequently too many of our youngsters getting out of school and struggling to find a job. But, you know, if they pick up the prerequisite skills and have the industry um, uh, introductions that Justin and his group have provided, I think that's a, that's a phenomenal service to to, to the student and, and to the state and, and to the industry in general. So kudos to the crowd. I enjoyed it, Justin. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. All right. If that's all our questions today, we'll wrap it up. And we appreciate all of you attending the webinar today. And if you are interested in seeing or touring the RFID lab, you may contact me or Justin, and we'll make sure that you get the VIP visit. Thanks a lot.